Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of our Antarctica vlog, and I hope if you've made it this far, you've enjoyed the experience so far. You join us as we're sailing down the famous, and famously narrow, Le Mer Channel, one of the most photographed places in Antarctica, and a gateway to the south. <laughs> Good morning. morning, morning. It's seven o'clock in the morning. Seven o'clock. We've been up for about half an hour now mm. as we navigate Le, Le Mer Channel and Le we're Mer now Channel. about to sail through the narrowest point. So I mean, it's just crazy. Our captain's I mean, done do. an amazing job because he's been navigating us through icebergs. There's lots of sea ice, so he's taken us through the icebergs. Yep. It's really narrow anyway. We can hear it like bits of snow thundering <laughs> off the thundering snow i mean yeah like the all the, all the kind of glasses all cracking and like making all these like really weird noises it sounds like thunder mm. um, we saw a little bit just fall off a little while ago we didn't manage to capture it but yeah so it's a bit speedy we're literally now sailing through the narrowest bit rich it's amazing so perhaps we'll just take you up there and, and film go through the tiny 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 bit but yeah good morning good morning you can see the full transit on our special video we compiled as part of our slow TV video series. I'll leave a link here and I recommend you take a look for a stunning and unique viewing experience. Scenic cruising doesn't get more dramatic than when Antarctica presents you with moody skies, brooding waters and ominous icebergs. It's so devastatingly beautiful you don't want to tear your eyes away even for a second. Soon we were heading ashore at Peterman Island for a snow algae covered stroll to Port Circumcision. Uh, mid hike report, we made it to the top of this sort of. It's quite slippery, that. Uh, as you can see, it's quite difficult to kind of negotiate your way up. But at the top here, it's windy, but I've um, got some friends up here. Share the view. We've got a great view. A great view of the Greg Mortimer. Worked out why the penguins walk like this. Helen's <laughs> yeah. worked out why the penguins walk like that. And it's stable. I fully agree. <laughs> like a penguin impression. Yeah. Well, it's really I'll let you into a secret. She always walks like that. <laughs> Along the way, we sighted Adele penguins, staking their claim amongst the Gentoos, and viewed the cross remembering three British Antarctic survey personnel who perished in an accident in 1982. Yes, this was a reminder that although tourists are by far the biggest category of visitors here in Antarctica, 45,000 per year and growing, it was still a deadly and unforgiving place for humans to be. Okay, we're now going on a Zodiac cruise, probably a two hour cruise, which is actually quite a long thing. Looking for peepees, whatever they are. Looking for peepees? What are peepees? Who knows? Mm. Well, here we go. <laughs> Along the way, we encountered plenty of snoozing crab eater seals and some mesmerizingly translucent blue glacial ice. Over lunch, we returned through the La Mer Channel. The clouds parted and signaled we would be gifted with our first sunny afternoon on the peninsula. Expedition leader Ashley organised for us to hand deliver our postcards to the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust's Port Lockroy base, and then Zodiac cruised to Dorian Bay for a landing at Damoy Point. Thank you. 
Okay. Here at Damoy Point, we peeked inside Damoy Hut, previously used by the British Antarctic Survey as a transit station for staff and stores flown south from the Skyway on the glacier above the hut. Yes, there's a runway under there somewhere. Well, look at the look at the weather. <laughs> Couldn't make it up, could you really? Different day to yesterday. Look it's at those mountains. Completely different day. Just take a look at these mountains. The mountains are phenomenal. They've probably been there all the while, but we just couldn't yeah. see them. I mean, the sky is just like a. In fact, you can't tell where the clouds are on the mountain's end. The mountains are so huge. And behind us, over here, is the old airstrip that they used to use to fly people further into the uh, Antarctic when the sea had iced over. Um, it's no so longer working. They used to have to sit and wait in this hut yeah. for the planes to come and take them. Which could take weeks. Um, but they know that that, that, stopped, that was stopped used in the 1970s sometime. Yeah. They now fly directly from Falkland Islands down to the base. In, I think it was Roth Net or something. I can't remember because we've been at so many places. We're having to... <laughs> so much information. Uh, pack in two days worth of things in a one day because of a weather system. We've got to um, cross the passage, Drake Passage, one day early, unfortunately. But... Uh, so yeah, so we're having to pack it all in. Both the kayakers and the snorkelers had a fantastic afternoon on and in the water, exploring the marine environment of the New Maya Channel, while we went for a bit of a hike in the snow-covered hills of Damoy Point. In the early evening, the weather was so good, we headed to Deck 8 for a polar barbecue. As we slowly sailed north through the New Maya Channel, we feasted on ribs, burgers, salads, crumble and toasty hot mulled wine. <laughs> we needed that. Despite the sunshine, it was freezing. <laughs> One thing's for sure, I'll never ever forget this evening. As we sailed back northwards through the Le Maire Channel, the weather couldn't have been more perfect and the famous Cape Renard Towers at the northernmost point stood out against the evening sun. These are also known as Una Peaks, after Una Spivey, the secretary of the Governor's Office in Stanley, Falkland Islands, who was working for what is now the British Antarctic Survey in the 1950s. I'm not sure they could quite get away with that these days. Hmm. Anyway, Bawdy, outdated humour aside, we were grateful of this evening's cruise as the weather was about to make sure we had a swift end to the expedition. Morning. It's, uh... Slightly different this morning. A bit of a choppy night, and uh, oh, you can hear that wind. And um, Helen's not feeling too sharp. I've taken a seasick pill and put some bands on, so I feel a little bit better. But uh, I'm out here on the open deck. After lunch on the Friday, Greg Mortimer sailed in fine weather up towards Half Moon Bay, our planned destination for our final landing of the voyage. Unfortunately, as we arrived, the winds reached up to 50 knots, making any attempt at landing too dangerous to pursue. In fact, the captain couldn't even drop an anchor as it was dragging the ship. So, sadly, we set our course farther north through the McFarland Passage between Livingston and Robertson Islands and headed into the dreaded Drake Passage. As soon as we left the shelter of Half Moon Bay and entered the Drake Passage, the seas picked right up, and though most guests had collected in the observation lounge for our sail away, they quickly started to disperse as the waves picked up and the ship started swaying a bit. 
By now it was about 5pm so we headed back to the room to take some seasick tablets and get ready for dinner. However, most of us started to feel quite ill and with the tablets making us drowsy we decided to miss dinner altogether and get an early night. Although it was a bit like sleeping in a washing machine we did manage to get a good 12 hours sleep. We were in the Drake Passage at least a day before we'd planned to be. The captain said this was because there was a front coming in that meant the five metre waves we were experiencing now would have been nine metres had we hung around. Hmm, no thanks. The ship is designed to glide through these conditions like a hot knife through butter and that's almost entirely due to the revolutionary X-bow design of the bow of the ship. Instead of slamming into large waves like a conventional bow, it cleaves them in half and drives through them like a dolphin or a whale would. In fact, these creatures were the inspiration for the design. But does it work? Well, I've got to say, the movement was definitely still there, but it was a lot smoother than on a conventional ship. There was not a single bang or shudder from the bow during our entire crossing. Yes, we still had that stomach-churning washing machine feeling, but at no point did the ship feel unstable, unsafe, vulnerable, or even creaky. So in that respect, this is simply the best design for sailing through choppy seas. It'll be interesting to see if larger cruise ships adopt this design in the future. We've already seen the evolution of it with Celebrity Edge Class and their parabolic ultra-bow design. A sort of halfway house between a traditional bow and an X-bow. Yes, as you can tell, I'm fascinated by this sort of stuff. And yes, I am a nerd. And we didn't go to breakfast. <laughs> We're still pinned to the bed. Um, every time we try and get up, it just feels like, oh, as you can see, seasick pills work really well <laughs> so um by been nearly 24 hours since we've eaten now so um i might venture out to try and get some green apples and some ginger so mm, if i can stay vertical for long enough and it's taken me all this time just to get my phone off the side mm. Let's see how we get on, eh? We passed Cape Horn at around 6am today, but you wouldn't have known it because <laughs> we couldn't see it and we were still feeling the effects. <clears throat> After enduring the rocking and swaying of the Greg Mortimer during the crossing of the Drake, we were relieved to enter the calmer waters of the Beagle Channel, where we picked up our pilot who will escort us to Punta Arenas. I managed to get some really decent shots of this. The wind here though was incredibly strong. It was 85 knots or 85 miles an hour, I can't remember which, but on the Beaufort scale, it's the highest you can get. Force 12, hurricane. Rather bizarrely, the ship was incredibly stable. I guess because we were heading straight into it and the wind was so strong, the sea was being blown almost flat by it, sort of pinned down, you know. Just before dinner, the Beagle Channel was extraordinarily beautiful as we sailed alongside the Darwin Ranges. Waterfalls fell from glaciers that tumbled down the slopes and freshly snow-dusted mountains, all bathed in an eerie evening light and viewed to the sound of the howling wind. After dinner, 
one of our expedition leaders, Steve, had a fireside chat ranging from personal experiences to the future Antarctic tourism. And the discussions reminded us all how lucky we were to be here. Well, it's really difficult to summarise this cruise. Antarctica is the most remote destination we've ever been to. The scenery is like an alien world, and the fact that apart from scientists and researchers, nobody lives here makes it even more fascinating. We were very lucky with the weather, and although it could have been better, enabling us to do more, it also could have been infinitely worse. So the days we had will be cherished in my memory forever. The Greg Mortimer is a fantastic ship and we'd highly recommend Aurora Expeditions to you if you're thinking of exploring this part of the world. As mentioned earlier, her design is perfectly suited for the type of seas you might encounter. If you've enjoyed this video series, please like this video, please subscribe and then click on the following links to further enjoy our entire adventure as we show you our pre and post cruise adventures in Chile. Well worth a watch. Thank you.